All right, we're live. All right. Welcome, guys. Welcome to the Journey Within. This is a journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of the death and rebirth. And today, I am very honored to uh, interview uh, someone whose hypnosis skills are just like mind blowing. I've seen him in action. And, uh, you know, just someone who's, uh, I, I can feel like a genuine heart and someone that, that knows a lot. And so uh, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to uh, interview Rong. What's up, man? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rong. Welcome. Um, thank you for being, thank you for inviting me, and I'm happy to be here. Dude, thank you for coming on, man. I think uh, this will be, this will be a fun discussion if uh, it goes into these controversial topics. But I yep. would love to, maybe you can share about like a little bit about who you are and, and what you do. Sounds good. So I am a, a peak performance coach. So I usually work with um, with clients who are normally entrepreneurs and performers and, and creators. So they are normally in a very high stress situ situation environment. And my goal is for them to help to help them um, remove their fears and control their emotions. Um, majorly, I use a lot of hypnosis and, and NLP, which is neuro linguistic programming. Um, along with a lot of uh, kind of healing modalities I learned from from uh, kind of spiritual practice and from shamanism. And uh, um, I also do lots of speaking um, talks and then also I do stand up comedy uh, kind of uh, just to bring more joy to the to, to the world. Yeah, and that that bit really um, it really interested me because there's not a lot well, first of all, there's not a lot of Asians who do hypnosis. So actually, first of all, hypnosis is this quote unquote alternative healing, right? Where it's like really weird and wacky. Second of all, you're Asian and you're into this stuff and you do stand up comedy. So it's just kind of like, you're you're just a rare breed, man. And it's I a very to... interesting combination, I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like what maybe we can we could uh, go into your story because I love to hear people's stories and how they they transform. Like, how did you get to this point where you're helping entrepreneurs in high stress uh, situations? Yeah. So it all started. Um, I can just quickly share my story um, to help you understand where I where how I got to where I am right now. So when I when I was born in China and I, I spent my first 22 years in China, I came here like 10 years ago. Um, and uh, when I was in China growing up, I was having a lot of social anxiety growing up. And then um, a lot of uh, I was very depressed because I noticed that I was just always being isolated with with uh, with others because I felt a lot of fear in, within myself, lots of anxiety, but I didn't know what I was. And at that time, it was just really hard to even talk about, you know, my emotions with my parents. I didn't talk about anything with my parents at all. So I just didn't know what's happening within myself. And then over time, I just didn't know what to do. And I got depressed. And uh, I got so depressed. Uh, when I was in high school, I was very suicidal. I, I almost mm. committed, committed suicide when I was when I was in high school. Um, but luckily, I didn't. Um, but that that sense of not belonging to any to any group, not not the sense of having anxiety talking with with anybody I don't know, and that sense of feeling depressed um led me to to a place where i just didn't know where i could do even after i came to the states so at one point i i i don't know why i always had this seed of, of public speaking that was always something within myself for some reason and at one time i was just watching a kind of random ted talk i think i just i don't remember the content of the ted talk but i just remembered that person being on the stage talking about, you know, the topic and then everyone was listening. And I was just had this thought that, Oh, what if I can do that? It would be amazing if I could be there sharing my stories and, and ideas with others. And uh, then it was my turning point basically for me to pursue public speaking. And I, I was mm. absolutely scared when I, when I started public speaking, I took some classes and I went to a public speaking class and, did the the whatever exercise I did it and asked the trainer how did I do and uh, he's like not good <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like okay <laughs> I should come back again so I came back a second time it was it was scary still and then I 
did again and then asked the trainer, how did I go? And then a trainer is like, yeah, you should come more. And, and I was like, how should I, how much, how, how much, how many sessions should I do in order for me to be better? And uh, he's like, yeah, it depends on how much money you have. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. but, I, but, he, but basically I kept going there. I, I went there every uh, couple of times a week, just like to keep taking taking trainings. And, and eventually like, I would, I would say six months later, I got better in terms of being more confident with my, with my speaking skills. Um, not only like my, my kind of a presentation skills, but also just my, my English communication in general, because I was not good at even speaking English. Mm -hmm. um, and then over time, I just found my passion. I got really interested in public speaking. I got obsessed with it. And I kept asking people how I can get better and better. And uh, I was lucky that I got to introduce to things like improv and, and acting um, because I, I knew they were all very relevant, not exactly, I say, but relevant to public speaking. So, so I kept taking the acting class and the improv classes and eventually got better and more confident with my, with myself. And then eventually I decided to go for stand up comedy, which is for me, the highest form of yeah. communication per se, also the hardest. And, uh, as I was pursuing this public speaking journey, giving more speeches and giving more talks, um, I, I also begin to take a lot of personal development trainings, um, to really improve myself. Um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, improving my, my, my mindset and all these things. And, and then, and the one time I was at a, at an event and, uh, I saw someone, uh, who was going through a lot of stuff. Um, and I was trying to help them, but I didn't know how, because I didn't have enough skills to help them. Right. And that time I just felt very, very helpless. I was like, I can give them talks and can share my stories with them, but I need the tools. I need tools for them to, for, to help them to make the changes. Yep. And that's the time I decided to go into coaching. Specifically, I started to taking NLP trainings. NLP basically is called Neuro Linguistic Programming, if you don't know what that is, which is basically a, a methodology um, to, to understand human patterns and human behaviors and change these patterns and behaviors um, on the unconscious level, which is similar to NLP to hypnosis which led me to hypnosis actually from NLP. And then from there, I began to start just coaching people and, 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 and do, do these therapeutic sessions with people and at the same time, just like improving myself as well. Um, and uh, I kept doing that. And eventually I got into more kind of into the spirituality and then um, began to work on, you know, um, kind of healing myself, but also begin to use all these modalities along with uh, with the most NLP to help my clients. True. So so now as I'm continuing working on myself and also I begin to learn more about um, how I can most effectively help my clients along the way. Yeah. So that's pretty much yeah, the I love that. summary of my story. That's interesting because it, it's like it started with public speaking. 100%. Huh. Yeah. So would you say that was the that was the catalyst for change before all the other stuff? Yeah, the public the I always said the moment I I went to a decide to go to my first public speaking class, training class, that was the turning point of my life. Hmm. And uh, I almost that I just trusted that that seed within myself when I when I saw that tech talk. Yeah. And I just went for it. I'm I'm curious because for someone who, you know, almost committed suicide, you're dealing with some depression and anxiety, and that's not easy at all. Mm -hmm. And to go from that to then, okay, I'm going to try this public speaking thing, which most people, right? Like, it's like, that's like the number one fear for most people. Like they'd yeah. rather be, they'd rather be like at a funeral. They'd rather be in the, you know, in that funeral yeah that casket rather than the person talking, yeah. you know? So yeah. like, how, what, what do you think, what do you think kept you going? You know? So I think there are two folds. The first is that, you know, there are only two reasons why people make changes. All right. One is from inspiration and one is from desperation. And uh, at that point I was at the bottom of my life and I, I just moved to a new city. I just broke up with my ex. 
Um, and then I, I had a lot of fear, a lot of just darkness within myself. And I needed something for me to keep going. Um, I chose public speaking because I remember one, one I, I told myself that I don't think I can, like, what's worse? It can't be any, anything worse than that, what I have right now. Yeah. So that also made, this, this makes me feel like, yeah, there's nothing to lose. That's why I just went for the things I always wanted to do, just even though I was extremely scared. Yeah. And the second thing is that um, that's something that I talk about it in my in sometimes in my talks as well, which is for some reason, um, I always had this image in my mind. Even when I was before I was getting public speaking, which is the person who who's speaking or who's communicating, who's being with others in a way that's confident, that's just charismatic. Mm -hmm. um that's at ease and every single time when i look at a mirror i i just see how far i am from that person but i picture that person in my head over and over again every day and i know this is the person i want to become and i know i can be there so it's just a matter of time for me to close that gap and and because i have that vision in my mind in my head in terms of who that person is that drives me that pulls me to to keep going no matter how hard it is so it's the vision that actually yeah. kept you going. Yes. Uh, yeah. Do you? So I'm, I'm curious here because not everyone like visualizes, you know, very well. Um, when you say image, do like, did you actually have this like, like a picture, like a visualization yes. of? Yeah. Yes. So yeah, I'm not a super visual person anyway. I'm, I'm not not sure why, but I'm visual is not my number one kind of sense, I'm top one sense. But when I when I when I was just picturing myself, I was not even just seeing myself there, right? I was literally imagining myself being there, first person, right? Living the movie, how living the movie, experiencing myself, interacting with other people, talking with other people in a way that makes everyone feels very comfortable. Yeah. And that is the feeling I have combined with images as well. So some would say, you know, because like I'm, I'm getting into uh, more spiritual woo woo stuff and, you know, law of attraction, of course, like all the all the gurus say, you know, you got to visualize, yeah. you got to visualize. Yeah. And, and it's it's, it's kind of interesting. That's what you did before you, you know, even got into this into well, this stuff. Well, when you talk about peak performance, right, if you look at basically a lot of, you know, artists, speakers, um, athletes, they do exactly the same thing. We just don't know. Yeah. Some people don't know. Yeah. They literally visualize how they're gonna how they're gonna be there when they're actually performing because when you actually do that you're actually rehearsing your head there are two reasons why first you're rehearsing your head in terms of how you're gonna do when you're actually in the competition when you're actually performing that's one thing because the more you repeat the more you're gonna, you're gonna get used to how, how it feels like when you're doing that right the second thing is that when we talk about motivation right there are two Basically, I, I I categorize them as like pull and push motivations, right? So push motivation basically is that you know, oh, I I I want to let's say, achieve this goal, and how do I achieve it? I just like push myself to do do something every single day, right, to get there, which is a lot of effort. Um, but by but if you but another one is like a pull motivation, which is I already see myself being that way, right, and already there, and then I'm just getting pulled together because. Hey, this is already me. I'm just gonna get like keep moving to get closer to that person. Yeah. And when you do that, it's a lot effortless per se. Yeah. So what it reminds me of is like a lot of people say, you know, this this doing versus being, and like the first part or like power versus force or whatever, like uh, these different terms that people use. Yeah. Um, one is like a lot of effort. The other one is, I guess, like a state of like uh, what you yeah. were saying, being right. Yeah. Well, I put it a different way. Um, when you say doing, right, we're talking about behavior, right? So, right. so we're like basically creating a new behavior, right? That that's aligned with the person we want to become, so that we can actually push ourselves together. When we say being, it's more about identity, which is mm -hmm. I am that person, and because identity is 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 a lot higher in terms of hierarchy, in terms of like which one is more unconscious, which one which one is more influential. If you have the right identity you will you will align your behavior to to be with that to to go get closer to that identity just because 
identity is just a bunch of beliefs coming together. And the belief we know is the strongest human force in the unconscious mind. Hmm. So we will stay consistent with how we what we believe about ourselves. And when we do that, basically our behavior or what I'm not will automatically be aligned with that identity. So we'll just so to say. That's how Got it you. work. Yeah. Yeah. And so that that um leads into a great question, you know, like you know, the granddaddy question, the question, like how do we how do we change our identity on this unconscious level? Like well, so um we're talking about changing beliefs, right? Changing identity, changing beliefs. And right. the reason why it's so hard to change your beliefs and change your identity is because they're conscious, right? And, the, you know, in, in hypnosis, we have this thing called a critical faculty, or critical factor, what I want to call it, right? So basically, that's basically part of our survival kit in our brain that's constantly comparing new ideas with, with what's already in our database, which is our belief system. So if you have a new idea coming in, but if it's not aligned with our current database, knowledge base, we're gonna reject this idea. That's what critical faculty is doing. So what happens basically is that when you have this this new belief you want it, new identity you want, you want it, you want it kind of you want to embody. But because it's not in your in your conscious your unconscious mind yet, because it's not in your current belief system yet, your critical faculty will reject this idea. That's why it's really hard to reprogram your unconscious mind, right? In this yep. way. Well, partially because we want to, we want to guard ourselves, and I don't want to, I don't want to like just receive any random ideas, just like put it into into my unconscious, right? It's kind of a part of protection uh, system, but at the same time, it also prevents us from really getting the useful identity of beliefs into our unconscious. So there are different ways you can actually begin to reprogram your unconscious mind by bypass the by bypassing this critical faculty. The the two most powerful way, well, a couple of most powerful ways. The one is basically your um, your emotional intensity, right? So the more intense mm -hmm. you feel about your identity, the more likely it will get into your unconscious mind. So that's why when we say um, people do affirmation, right? I'm I'm beautiful, I'm smart, I'm I'm whatever. Sometimes it doesn't work. It's because when you say it without that congruency, with that emotional intensity behind it, your unconscious mind will not receive it, will not take it, will not accept it. So, so the more intense I feel, because when I was thinking about public speaking, being on stage at that time, I was feeling that I was really feeling that I I was very comfortable on the stage and people were were just being very comfortable around me as well. I could feel at ease when I'm speaking. So that's actually creating that emotional intensity. Hmm. And the second factor is is repetition, which is pretty straightforward. The more you repeat, the more because that's why you rehearse every day. The more you say or, or the more you see an image, the more you you picture whatever you want to picture, and it's more likely it will it will get into your unconscious mind. And the last one, of course, is hypnosis, right? When we're in a hypnotic moment, hypnotic state, your your conscious mind gets offline, your critical faculty gets offline, so that the beliefs that you want to have, the, the identity you want to create, will be more likely to get into your unconscious mind to be part of you. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's that's really well said. So I'm, I'm interested. Well, I was going to take it one way. Well, actually, no, let's. Let's talk about the uh, the hypnosis since sure. yeah. we're, we're both into that and like, um, well, let's just start with like a, like a general basic question. Like, what, how how would you understand hypnosis and maybe like what are the uh, the common like misconceptions that people have about it? Yeah, so I I sometimes do uh, street hypnosis with with people and I've I've taken a couple of hypnos uh, street hypnosis trainings. Um, and I, I just, I just found it fascinating to just like see different perspectives from different people when they think about hypnosis. And when you're on the street, people come to you, they're like, "Oh, I'm, I want to try it, but I'm, I'm not sure it's going to work, or I'm afraid of whatever that is." Right? <laughs> it's just interesting to see. But I think um, if I remember correctly, correctly, if we summarize it, um, one category is basically they are, um, they think that hypnosis will not work for them. They they cannot be hypnotized, right? Which, which, which is 100% not true, right? Because everyone can be hypnotized. It's just a matter of, of, of you know, how deep you go, right? Mm. And how long it might take for you to be hypnotized. Um, and then second thing is that they are afraid that they might lose the control. They might lose control because they are being manipulated per se, right? That's kind of a misconception of hypnosis. Um, and then... 
what we have to understand is that like we cannot hypnosis is basically just a focus attention right when you're in that state it's a focus attention um and it's not about you lose your your control for a hundred percent it's it's actually you become more alert more aware of what's happening around you but you just you just choose to not be reactive to what's happening around you right so you can still have the the choice if if i ask you to do something that's not align with your moral, right? Or ask you to like rob a bank. You're not going to do it. That's 100% for sure. Hmm. I wish they could do, but. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could uh, pull the yeah. puppet strings. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, and then um, I think the last last one is more about um, they are, um, they're afraid that um, they they will, you know, being, being hypnosis forever, they can get out of it. Um, but that's it's the same thing. You have full control over it. Um, if you want to get out of trance, you can definitely do it, right? It's more about how comfortable you are. Sometimes people want to stay in trance because it's so comfortable. It's so good. It feels so good instead of like they, they have to stay in trance per se. Right. So when you uh, went from you know NLP to hypnosis, I'm curious if you feel like do you favor one over the other? Um, do you kind of inter you know use them interchangeably? Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's just start with that. I I I think I think both are well. Well, NLP basically is is partially from hypnosis. Right. Right. So NLP for me is that they modeled, um, you know, Milton Erickson, specifically him, um, the. I think the greatest hypnotist, hypnotherapist in the world, um, and then and then basically they attract ex extracted the 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 kind of the, the approaches he's using to work with his patients, and then he ba they they basically just extract the patterns and then um, apply these patterns or approaches with other people and get to the same result, and that becomes part of NLP. So of course NLP also kind of learn from other places, but for me they are they are different per se because I for me um, hypnosis it's there is an art component that's not being captured by by NLP because NLP is more about for me they're more it's more structured it's more analytical um, versus hypnosis more flowy it's it's there's no one way to do it you have to keep you know being in the moment with the client to find the right way to do it um and then you have to constantly be with that client just so that you can understand where they are in the in the in their in their hypnosis journey per se right and nlp for me it, it's it's fantastic in terms of getting the strategies um and then apply these strategies to to use for for the clients um, and uh, what I noticed personally, what I noticed is that when I was only using NLP, sometimes I got really, um, I got really trapped into figuring out what techniques to use. Um, and, and, and I just sometimes lost the connection with the client, if that makes uh, sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but same time, I think NLP does provide a lot of structure, um, so that it's actually easier to follow. And is there like proven strategies you can use to actually make, make help people make changes so it's easier to actually use? I'm curious. Well, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna go a different way. So with with hypnosis, do you use that to uh, like boost your public speaking skills or have you used that? Are there like any other ways that hypnosis has has benefited you personally? Um I think a hundred percent, you know, I think the first thing I, I just realized is that I have a better understanding of what unconscious mind is, you know, how to work with unconscious mind, right? How to make these unconscious changes. And a lot of things we're doing, they're already like part of hypnosis, right? When we're doing guided meditation, they are basically hypnosis, but right. people just don't realize it. Um, and, and for me, um, Public speaking is not just like speaking public, right? It's also about you 
you're there presenting something um, at the risk of, you know, not getting enough feedback from the audience, which is similar to to stand up comedy per se. Because I, for me, stand up comedy is kind of the the, the more advanced or more the harder version of public speaking because both yeah. of them are telling stories. Um, and then you constantly have this judgment of being rejected, right? The sense of I'm not good enough if I don't get people to engage with me. If people are not paying attention, what does that mean about me? You know, if I'm if people are not laughing, does that mean I'm, I'm not I'm not likable? Whatever that is, right? Mm. So I think hypnosis it has been helping me because I sometimes do self hypnosis on myself as well, right? It, it has been helping me just releasing all these um, deep traumas I have. Um, mm. Because and also gradually change my beliefs about about who I am. Because I think we all have this this you know core uh, limiting stories about about ourselves in terms of I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, right? And and the more we you use hypnosis to I use hypnosis to help me change gradually loosen up this belief or these beliefs, um, and then gradually creating new stories about about who I am. It helps me with my confidence when doing public speaking and stand-up comedy. It helps me be more present with the audience when I'm actually on the stage. Mm. So these are the beneficial things that that come from um, hypnosis. Um, and uh, I, for me, when they, uh, public speaking is not just public speaking; it's also kind of a personal development journey. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's big. Um, so now I actually want to go the opposite way and. Do you think the skills that you've gotten from, you know, from stand up, from presentation and, and public speaking, do those translate well into hypnosis, like going the other way? Um, I think so. I think so. I mean, let's say for for public speaking, right? Like, I think the big thing is basically, um, like pausing is a very, very big thing, big thing in a um in public speaking because you know you need to pause to create that dramatic fact whatever to help how people think and pause is all pausing is also very important when you're coaching with clients because you it's almost that you have to give them enough space for them to process if you go too fast they they don't have enough time to process so being comfortable being comfortable with pause yeah. right is something i learned from speaking and stand-up comedy and i can be silent for a couple of minutes without any issues um and same thing as making eye contact that's a big thing you know when you're doing speaking when you're doing comedy making eye contact which is something i was not comfortable with when i started but over time i began to be more comfortable with with eye contact um which makes me more present with the clients that's one another way to put it um and of course if i'm talking about like stand-up comedy which is a part of it, it's just you know making people laugh right the jokes and humor and all that and we all know that humor is a, is a such a dramatic, such an amazing way to break people's patterns. Yes. So, so yeah. So when I, when I use jokes sometimes to break the patterns uh, for the clients and it does create that pretty big impact um, and then help them get out of their own, um, own state of being stuck and they can find the solutions from there. Sometimes it works that way. Yeah. You think that this, the, with a stand-up because I, I feel like there are a lot of like parallels between um hypnosis at least like a like an ericksonian type of hypnosis and and stand-up because like a lot of stand-up is just like telling stories yes really yeah. like the the whole structure yeah it's just like huh i'm like i feel like these two can really just be used interchangeably but a hundred percent yeah i think is this is still something i'm exploring like i i'm still learning how to how to how to merge these two um because i i developed them separately um and and it's almost like there's one part that's that's the identity of stand-up comedian another part uh, as, as the identity as a hypnotherapist and i'm trying to merge these two yeah. um, and see how it works from there stage hypnotist <laughs> right it that's one way says. that's one way to combine them yes yeah that's yeah them, yeah so you know Knowing like the the amount of trials and tribulations that you went through in in stand up and in uh, public speaking, is that something that you recommend for everyone, uh, like to build confidence or personal development or whatever? 
Well, if you talk about, you know, how do you build more confidence, you overcome your biggest fear? And public speaking, you know, is the number one fear for so many people, right? And and I, I mean, if you don't have the fear of public speaking, I don't think, I think you still get out from it, but I don't think you can get that much from it, right? But if he's, but you have a fear of public speaking, you're afraid of yeah. doing it. Yeah, you should do it. <laughs> um, because, because there are two folds in terms of building your confidence. The first is that the moment you decide to do public speaking, in spite of your fear, you're basically creating this muscle, right? We call it courage, right? To, to do something in your life that you have a strong fear about. And that muscle is, is not something you're born with, right? Because otherwise what people are looking for the comfort to security. But it's only when you begin to build that muscle of, okay, I'm going to have that, that feeling of jumping, even though I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust that it will be fine. I will be fine. That courage is something we can be, can build. It's not, it's not something you were born with. You can build that. So by pushing yourself to do public speaking, you can actually build that muscle. That's one thing. The second thing is that when you are doing public speaking, right, over and over again, there's no way you're going to get worse. <laughs> If you're gonna get worse, I don't know what to say about you, right? Are you sure? Well, wow, okay, yeah. Because you, it's almost like you're, 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 you're surviving over and over again, right? It, it, you're not gonna die. If you're not gonna die, you're gonna thrive. That's two things. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't get worse, you're gonna get better. So yeah. you're gonna get better and better over and over again, right? Over time. And when you do that, you're building that confidence. You're building that identity. You're shaping that belief about who you are. Right, because that sense that I'm not good enough, right? Gradually will become become oh, I am good enough to do public speaking because I do get better and better. Right. So these two folds will help you be a better, no matter if you want to do public speaking full time or you want to just be a you know, a, a person who has more confidence, it will just help you to get there faster. Do you do you still feel the the, the fear when you do public speaking? Not much anymore. Um, Interesting. I still have some, some fear when I'm doing stand-up comedy. Um, and I still have some fear when I'm, when I'm doing improv, the moments I jump into the, the scene, keep in mind that, that a lot of people, they, they think that fear is bad. Like, I don't want to fear. I don't want to feel fear when I, when I'm doing something. I think that's not, that's an illusion, right? I think we all have some fear. Right when we do something that's out of our comfort zone, if we don't have that fear, I think it's not good. The first thing it's not good is because fear actually creates that that sense of stress, and that stress would actually help you be more present when you're actually performing. That's why that's why we talk about flow state. Right, it's a state of of you have the the foundation, you have the skills. But also, I we stress you to some extent. You actually feel that there's something that's out of my control. Gotcha. And that is the flow state. That's how you perform the best. If everything's fine, you feel very comfortable, stay at home doing whatever. You're not gonna perform your best. So fear is actually good to help you stay present, stay focused. And the second thing is that you know, if you feel fear, rash, kind of a normal fear, not like jumping off the bridge fear, right? Uh, the fear that's like not not like irrational. If you have the fear, it only only shows you there is something that you have to you have to work through and you have to grow, right? But you know we all have to grow in our lives. If you don't grow, we're we're basically either we grow, or we die in two ways, and it's almost like we have to constantly seeking fears for you to keep grow, and mm -hmm. that's basically one of the 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 signs of being alive. Is fear is the yes. distress? And, yeah. Yes. No, that's a good point. It's a great point. Yeah. Um, I wanted to to touch on some of the the work you said you you started to do some like shamanism or explore that. Yes. What what did you what did you find? Like what what's the cool thing to do? You know. I don't think there's like specific thing that it's hard when we talk about spirituality. We talk about healing. We talk about shamanism. I think it just um, we talk about. I think we talk about um, this word of like healing, uh, which is which is 
which is the opposite of of finding a quick solution. Because when I started doing coaching or doing hypnosis with with clients, I always felt that I should have solved their problem right away, and then they can just go, you know, without coming back to me anymore, right? Because I want to yeah. feel like they they can just go ahead and do their own thing after one session. And that's how I also how I you know worked on myself. Just I have a problem, I have a trigger, I resolve the trigger, I move, I move on. I feel like I'm 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 done, like I'm fixed or whatever. Um, and then um, then I after I got into the kind of the spiritual world and shamanism and stuff, and I begin to realize that even though we can actually help you feel better or felt help help myself feel better by using a specific technique. By the end of the day, there, there's layers after layers after layers after layers. And and what we talk about healing is not about using your mind to say, hey, this is the end. Healing is more about your entire life. You're gonna you're gonna keep working on yourself to feel better and better about yourself, to feel more safe about yourself, about the world and how you interact with the world. Mm. So it becomes not a problem solution relationship it's more about this this journey of loving yourself more over and over again over time so eventually you become more whole and complete and and it's hard it's very even though the approach might be similar but the the mindset is very different right here we're not looking for the quick fix we're looking for ways for you to be more to create more compassion and love towards yourself which is something I did not understand before because I always felt that, you know, if I, if I, if I can, if I have this problem, I can, I can fix this problem. Like if I feel it's the anger, I can, I can resolve that anger issue. You're done. Right. But over time I begin to realize the first step of doing that is actually to begin to, to be kind with yourself which means that to be aware of the fact that it's okay for me to be anger, angry. For me, it's okay for me to, to, be, um, to be frustrated. It's okay for me to feel that anxiety because we're human beings. We, we have all the, all the triggers. We're not perfect, right? So just by learning that, it's almost like I begin to realize it doesn't really matter. Coming back to the first, we talked about before, doesn't matter if we help that person fix all the issues in, immediately. Hmm. Maybe all we need right now is for them to realize that's okay for them to feel this way. And that's already for, it's already enough for them to make that progress towards the healing because they're going to spend their entire life healing, right? We all do. And if you stop, you're going to be stuck. If that's the case, does it matter if I fix that person right away or we just I just open up the, the, the space a possibility for them to explore what's possible for them and gradually they will begin to heal themselves and find more resources themselves. So now I have a curious question about um maybe your your like therapy philosophy. Mm -hmm. Uh because I, I I I can see both sides of the spectrum here where there's one spectrum that says that's more, much more um, positive thinking, solution focus, kind of more like the Tony Robbins, like, yeah, like, yeah, you know, you don't, you don't need to dig into the past and, you know, whatever, right? You just, you know, you trick the, the NLP and the positive thinking and you just focus yeah. on what you want because whatever you focus on expands. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then like the other side, you know, the, the shadow work. You know, yeah, let's we got to dig into that that trauma and the unconscious yeah. and yeah. really understand that. Um, how do you because it seems like you, you do a little bit of both. Right. I do both and things. I do. I, I, I do as well. I'm curious, like, how do you reconcile that that seeming tension? So it's kind of hard to, to there's no specific bound, like kind of a threshold or boundary to say, hey, this is one. This is another one. Right. We, we all take like. These are, these are, when you talk about very extreme cases where like, I'm just talking about like thinking positively, whatever, and just living every day as great. Like if I feel the pain, like if I feel like the anxious in my feeling, I, I just want to get out of it. I just want to feel good. Right. I can change my state. That's what Tony says. Change your state. Right. Right. Um, and then 
the, the healing basically is not about changing your state. Actually, it's for you to lean into that state. Hmm. Um, because when you lean into that state, you begin to notice that, that there's no power in that state anymore for you because you're not fighting against it. Um, I think I think eventually you will have to face that that shadow and you know or let me put it a different way whatever we're doing by the end of the day is change our beliefs change our core limiting beliefs core stories that's the end goal you can do it in a more gentle way which is you know allowing that feeling to unfold, allowing that story to unfold, and then you discover what's in there and then find the, the empowerment there, and eventually you make that shift. That's more on the spiritual side. Or it can be more solution-based, which is what I talk about. Let's say you talk about affirmation, right? I think affirmation is more on that solution-based side, right? Right. It's more about, hey, I, the, you know, I would just say it over and over again. Eventually, I can reprogram the unconscious mind so that, so that the belief, online belief is shifted. And when that when that belief is shifted, it will impact the core story because it's indirectly related, right? If you change a belief, you will change that core story behind it as well. The confusion people have is that um, if you if you I mean, there's a difference between embracing your emotions versus coping with your emotions. So even when you do, you know, the affirmation way, right? There's still a sense that I I I want to embrace that emotions, embrace mm. that feelings. Because by the end of the day, we want to do even in NLP, we talk about every single feeling, every single part, you know, has a positive intention behind it. Yeah. Right? If we don't honor that part of intention, if we resist that that part of intention, that that part, it will persist. Right? So we still want to honor that part. Um, and then the the way um, we cope with this sometimes is that we we, we 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 just escape from that. We avoid that problem, right? And then just pretend everything is okay. And that is the, is the, I don't think that's the right solution-based approach, but it's just trying to, people trying to avoid the problem itself. Right, yeah, it's like a trap. Yeah. And I think that's the misunderstanding of, of that approach, of the solution-based approach, right, for, for some people. Gotcha. Um, but when you begin to embrace it, like knowing that this feeling is there, and I, I don't want to feel this way, but I'm honoring that, that, honor that intention of that feeling, then I can find a solution there, right? Because by the end of the day, what we want to do is just change change our core living belief, core stories, and both actually can get you the same outcome. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Um so I want to ask about some of the fun stuff. Yep. Uh, with I guess I guess this relates to shamanism, right? And so uh, I know that part of your journey has been um, with psychedelics and the transformative yeah. power of of that. Yeah. Um, maybe you could share a little bit about like what that was like. I'm sure there's different kinds, right? Like yeah. what what that's like. How did you get into it? Like what's that like? Well, first I'm I'm in Colorado, so um, <laughs> it's pretty common in Colorado. Gotcha. Um, and and uh, I think this is the trend that's happening right now. And I think people begin to realize that these plant medicine can actually help you heal a lot faster, right? And that's why people go to Peru, go to Costa Rica to do all these ceremonies these days. A lot more, a lot of people are doing that. A lot of celebrities are doing that. A lot of entrepreneurs yep. are doing that. It becomes like quite common. Um, what I, what I, so here's the thing, you know, I think when we talk about, you know, using, this is comparing like hypnosis versus using like psychedelics or using, you know, prime medicine for you to, uh, to change or to, to heal. So, you know, in hypnosis or in, in LP process as well, this is a kind of different way to actually explain the, the, the one I talked about earlier about the solution based versus like healing based. Um, when we, when we talk about, um, uh, we use hypnosis in LP, normally clients come to us with a problem, right? And then what we do is basically we, we, we find a solution, right? To resolve that problem. We're not 
normally we're not addressing the core 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 stories behind behind that problem itself. Our intention is that by addressing that problem, right, there will be some change, some shift in the unconscious, right, mm. and then then they come come back with different problem, and then we help resolve that problem as well, and they then they come with different problem, we solve that problem as well, because we always have problems. There's no way we don't have any problems. When we resolve enough problems, your unconscious might begin to understand. Okay, this is our relation to this core story. And then all the problems are, are changing the core story itself. And maybe the core story is not true anymore. The core story mm -hmm. is the core beliefs. And gradually you begin to change that, that core, core story, core beliefs itself. Right? Like plant medicine, no matter what that is, if you talk about more extreme case like DMT, right? It, it's just, it's really just sh shifting your reality in a way that that's just, it's just impossible to do without the medicine. Meaning that when you see the world as it is with the medicine, if if it the, your, all the filters you created over the years, right, all the beliefs you created over the years, they're gone. So you just see the world as a as a as a pure, let's say, baby, right? To see it, and then you can also examine all the traumas you've you developed over and over again through the years, and see it almost from a from a way that's not. That's that's without these layers, so you can see what's course what's the core story behind it. Got you. And when you do that, you see it from different perspective, and then you get out of medicine. Your world is going to be different because that core story is getting exposed, right? And that that and and you examine it from from a adult perspective, and it's not going to be the same. You're going to be questioning that core story, that core meaning story. And you're basically directly impacting that core or changing that core story, versus for 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 um, you know hypnosis or NLP, you're indirectly changing that core story. Interesting. I've never heard it articulated that way. That's just That's my cool. understanding, and I think yeah. um, another way to put it is, um, I think it's it's from Melissa Tears, and she said basically normally right like when you when people come to you with the problem in hypnosis it's almost like you have a table you, you just basically work on one leg at a time right and then you work on second legs on a third leg and the when you're using plant medicine right you're almost like you're flipping the entire table hmm no more right? table yeah <laughs> so it's like a very different way to, to see things and that's why it's, the plant medicine is so powerful just because like years of therapy, like 10 years of therapy, 20 years of therapy can be resolved in one session. Yeah. Because all the filters, all the layers are gone. I'm I'm curious, like what's been what's been most transformative for you? Um, in terms of like the blood plant medicine or a psychedelic? Um, well, I for me, I think I I I just did like Alaska ceremony. Oh. which is very popular right for yeah. people to talk about it and it, it is very powerful um because it does um i think there are two folds the first is basically um it, it lets you same thing let you see all the traumas you have directly so you actually see them you feel the fear you 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 go with the fear and then you still you can kind of almost like you live with that fear for a while and then you begin to realize that you don't need to be fearful anymore Mm. Right, because you're because at that time, the reason why we create all the conditions, all the all the all the um, you know beliefs, all the patterns, is because our unconscious mind is trying to is trying to protect us from you know these dark moments or scary moments, right? That's why people have trauma, PTSD, the same thing, right? You want have we don't want them to we don't want our unconscious mind doesn't want us to experience the same pain anymore. But when you stay in that pain or darkness for like long enough, your unconscious mind begins to realize that you are going to be okay no matter what. Hmm. And when that happens, they don't need a pattern. We don't need a pattern. We don't need a strategy. We don't need a belief to protect ourselves. That's I the shadow work. Yeah, right? yeah. And the second thing yeah. is that you know, all the traumas are stored in our body. All the emotions are stored in our body, yep. right? There, there's energy around it. There's, there's a um, emotional charge around it. The reason why we have the traumas, we have the beliefs, 
uh, or limiting beliefs or, or 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 limiting stories is not about it's it's the, not about the event self. It's about more about the emotional charge we're, we 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 we're we're putting on top of other stories and 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 thoughts. Right. right? So when you begin to re- or energy is the same thing, right? When you begin to release that energy that's stored in your body, you begin to almost discharge that emotion around that story, around that that thought, around that belief. And if ayahuasca does have a physical purge, that kind of purge effect, which is to release that and energy. And then when you do that, when you realize that the events that you that, that happened when you were a kid, that belief you created when you were a kid saying that no one loves me, that emotional charge is getting resolved slightly. Mm. And that intensity is less anymore, which means that the thought or the story, it's just a thought and the story. Right. 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 There's no attachment to it anymore. Right. And of course, you will, you had to do, if it's like core, core, core stories, you had to probably do a couple of times maybe to, to resolve that, but you notice that it's getting loosened up. Yeah. There's less yeah. charge around it. Interesting. I know um, people have a lot of different experiences in ayahuasca. I have a friend who did it and he told me about his experience. It didn't sound pleasant. I'm like, I told him like, dude, you're not selling this to me. Like I wanted to do it. But now that you, you told me about your, your experience, I'm good. (laughs) Like I don't want to do it anymore. It was, it was not pleasant, right? It's, it's not, it's, it's designed not to be present, be be pleasant. It's Mm. actually the hardest thing ever because because it's almost like letting you fe- face that deepest fear over and over again. <laughs> and, and, and it's, yeah, it's almost that, but you know, it's going to be okay because you're still, you're not going to die. It just like mentally you feel like you're, 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 you're going to die. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Same thing. So. Like I said, like as doing public speaking or stand up comedy, the same thing, you know, it's yeah. like, it's, the same, it's a it's a near death experience, right? Mm. Near death feeling, but it's not real. Um, so I would say, yeah, it's it is hard. Um, it's not easy. Um, but I think the harder it goes, the bigger the breakthrough you will get on the other side. Yeah, the more pain, the more love. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. The more point, the more pain, the more the more the, the more pain you feel, the more the bigger the block it is. Like it's holding you back, even like it's the big block that's that's there. It's holding you back, right? Yeah, yeah. So when you resolve that, you will just you have a bigger relief, at least. Yeah. Well, I'm. I'm. That's something I'm definitely looking into. Uh, well, I guess it's public <laughs> now, recorded. But yeah, I'm definitely, you know, looking into that. And I had that, you know, I did share with you, I had that plant medicine experience once this year, actually. And and uh, I don't think it really transformed me. I don't think there were like, any like lasting effects, but it's like it opened a, it opened a door and it yeah. showed me what's possible. So I, I think there's, the, that's the, sometimes when I'm, as I begin to explore more like healing modalities, um, I noticed when the pure solution based approach versus healing based approach, how my clients are reacting. When when I'm working with them on a solution based using solution based approach, right? They feel sad, they feel they feel depressed, they come to the to the session. After one session, they feel great, they feel amazing, they feel fantastic, they feel empowered. Yep. And normally that's what we do with them after using a pro a solution based approach. If I use a healing based approach, Normally, the, their response after the, the session is that, I don't know. I don't know what's happened. I feel there's something shifted, but I don't know what that is. I'm confused. Yeah. That's the response, right? But I, that's how I know, actually, they are actually making a bigger impact deep on unconscious level because your conscious mind, their conscious mind hasn't caught up yet. Mm. Yeah. And and wasn't it like Milton Erickson that said um confusion precedes enlightenment, something like that? Yes. Yeah. 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 That's crazy, man. Yeah. Wow. I um 
that's a, that's a new perspective. That's that's really cool, man. Thank you. That's something I observed, and I'm still hesitant to. Depending on the people, right? If they're very mind heavy, I might not go for this like healing based approach because they're not ready yet. Mm. They're gonna leave the room feeling frustrated because they don't know what's happening, which has happened. Right. So I, Nothing I had to, worked. Yeah. And prime them with the solution based approach and make them feel great, so they can build rapport and then credibility. And then I will take them to the more healing based approach if I have to. It's like the candy. It's like I the, know. The yeah. Hook. Give me one candy. Yeah. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. Now we're gonna feel the pain. You know. <laughs> uh, I like that, man. Well, I think that's that's a good place to um, to end, man. And if if people want to contact you and, yeah. and work with you, how can they do that? So um, I have a website um, called www.theronway.com. And the because my name is R O N G Ron, so it's the wrong without W way dot com. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you will see uh, the, the information there. And I, I also just published a book with uh, the other many authors. We wrote a book about about how to activate your life with all the tips and exercises for you to to practice, um, to use, to make your life better, to make your life better. And you can find the link there in the in the um, on the on the website as well. Awesome. Yeah. And I have, uh, I, I should have all of those links uh, in the description. Perfect. So wrong, man. I appreciate it. This, this was definitely a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Justin, thanks so much for, for having me here. Appreciate it. Awesome. All right, guys. Peace out. And uh, yeah. Goodbye. Bye.